and I uh, welcome you to my journey here, and uh, I'm glad to be a small part, at least, of, of your journey. I think it is important. I think it's important for many people at every shop uh, to be uh, fluent in NoSQL and at least explore NoSQL options to see where it might fit in your shop, uh, even if it is an all-SQL shop, like so many of them are. Here's a little bit of background on myself, do a lot of the speaking and the training and so on, but I guess the main point to make here is that I work with a lot of large companies and uh, I can bring you and will bring you some ideas from those companies in terms of what we're doing uh, at these companies with NoSQL. And indeed, most of them do have NoSQL uh, prototypes, proofs of concepts, if you will, things that are maybe pre-production, some in production for sure. So it is important to get on board with uh, some of the opportunities that NoSQL presents. NoSQL affects the entire enterprise. All right, this is not for necessarily the Googles and the Yahoos and the Ebays who already have their NoSQL wares aboard and already understand this. And actually, in many cases, uh, began the process of, uh, began, began and continue to contribute to the NoSQL community. It's for the rest of us. It's for the banks and the insurance companies and the retail organizations and consumer goods companies and so on and so forth. So that's really the target audience for this today. So I do some writing, et cetera, and have been a Fortune 50 IT executive. So here we have what I'm calling now the former enterprise information holy grail. This is something that many of my clients continue to aspire to. And indeed, it's a worthy journey for sure. And uh, I show a couple of different data warehouses on there. That's only realistic. I don't know that we'll ever get to a single warehouse in one of these large enterprises. Uh, I show a lot of cubes in the environment, a lot of those multi-dimensional databases, if you will, in the data mart layer. I show some, some data marts off to the side, not really interacting with the data warehouses, and that's only normal. That's only acknowledging sort of the reality of the situation. So this is a nice, clean environment. Uh, so my point, though, is that there's a lot that, has, that is changing now to our enterprise information holy grail. There's a lot of things happening on the SQL side of things. There's, in, in my experience, there hasn't been a period of a few years that has seen more progress in information management than the last few years. And obviously a lot of it's in the NoSQL area, that's why we're here, but SQL hasn't been standing still uh, itself. And so I'm going to fold in a lot of SQL things to this slide as we move along here. But right now, I'm not showing any no SQL on the slide. But we do have to get away from this idea that there is one size fits all, that everything maybe should be plowed into the data warehouse. And when there's a new requirement, we automatically do A, B, and C for it. We have options today. And information is a very important corporate asset. It is the asset that companies are distinguishing themselves on. If you really think about a lot of the strategic objectives of a company, it gets back to information. And we're the stewards of that information. We information management professionals. We need to put it in the right place to succeed. We can't be constrained by necessarily how we've done it so far. I think it's going to get more complicated before it gets less complicated in terms of information management architecture. This, uh, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to progress the legacy environment. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't consolidate data warehouses, as you should. This doesn't mean you shouldn't consolidate and get control over that multidimensional cube environment out there, as you should. It means that you need to be considering other things that fold in and some things that go across the top over the whole environment that help to uh, thread it all together. So SQL's not been sitting around. There are workarounds in SQL for some of the benefits of NoSQL, but those workarounds I have found to be expensive, unmanageable, and not scalable. And this is why I think that NoSQL has a place in production in many enterprise environments. But we are getting away from this. We are getting away from the relational database data page. And I'm definitely not saying we're doing any ripped and replaces. As a matter of fact, most NoSQL will enter environments for net new applications, not replacing what you have going on today 
in terms of relational databases. Over time, the focus will shift. We'll do some more in NoSQL. But the relational database will continue to be a very important part of an information management envir environment. And so if you've never seen it like this before, let me just show you this aspect of the page because I think from here you can understand where a lot of the benefits do come from relational databases. I don't want us as we move forward into NoSQL to lose sight of the benefits of SQL and to understand where that SQL comfort zone may sit. So here we got, we got a couple records on the page, okay? Uh, one key thing here is the row IDs at the end of the page are actually offsets to where these records begin within the page. This helps the data navigator, the data management layer of the DBMS to figure out where all the records exist. And all the columns are there, and it's the same columns for every row. And that's really key as we go to NoSQL because that will not be true. And let's add another row. We've added a row ID. We add the offset. Boom, there's another row, and on and on and on. Most pages have dozens to hundreds of records on them, depending upon the size of the page and obviously the size of the record. So while we're here, uh, let's think about some of the random access, which is very interesting because you can go to an index. You can find the index entry being the key and the RID. Maybe it's page 100, record number three. And let's say this is page 100. Uh, it would go, the uh, data manager would go to 100 times the page size and land itself at the beginning of this page, go to the end of the page, come back three offsets, go to that offset, grab the record. Now, if you didn't follow what I just said, that's okay. Um, but what I'm uh, trying to uh, portray here is the navigational aspects of a relational database data page. Okay. So switching gears a little bit here, what does big data mean? Well, same question kind of is, what does NoSQL mean? I haven't really defined that yet. Well, there are two sides of the same coin in my view. And I'm not trying to define anything here for you. I'm not trying to be the analyst that puts out new terminology or anything like that. I'm telling you how you can go about interpreting some of the other things that, that you're going to encounter best, all right? So as you go on in your journey with NoSQL, and big data for that matter, you're gonna be able to navigate those waters because you'll have an understanding of how people generally refer to this stuff. So big data, coming from that perspective, that means data in NoSQL. That means data that the workload really belongs in NoSQL because it scales beyond a certain measure, uh, both in terms of size, and maybe the complexity of the data, uh, the unstructuredness of the data and so on. We'll talk about that. Uh, this tends to be sensor data, social data, web data, uh, just complete data. Uh, I have a telecom client, for example, that's now with NoSQL solutions able to store all of their CDR logs. It's not that they couldn't do it before in, our, in a relational database. It's just that it took up a lot of space and time and cost, and now they're really able to, to do more with that. They, they don't need a lot of the accoutrements of the relational database upon that particular data set. Data in a system that does not support SQL. Okay, that's another way of saying data that's in NoSQL. So is NoSQL a system that doesn't support SQL? Yes, I guess it is. I really don't like the term NoSQL because it's trying to create an industry around something that it is not. And I'll add that it's getting perilously close to with a lot of the, the, uh, the data access methods that are really starting to look a lot like SQL. Is it a system with some arbitrary size like petabytes? Is that the new black? Is that the new standard for, what we, for, for what, when we have to do something different to the data? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, truth be told, a lot of these NoSQL, I think by far most of these NoSQL solutions are in the maybe tens of terabytes range, as opposed to in the petabytes range. So, uh, you know, when you should start thinking about it, it kind of depends on a lot of things, including the size of the data. Now, is it Hadoop? Is big data Hadoop? Well, we often think about the, the two interchangeably, but it's certainly not. Hadoop is NoSQL, but there are so many others that are NoSQL. A lot of people, when they talk about NoSQL, though, to let you know, they don't mean Hadoop. They don't put Hadoop in that category, but I do. 
and some of us do, and Hadoop actually doesn't use SQL, so I say it's no SQL. But one point to, to leave you with on this slide is that not many workloads should go to either one. So why are we suddenly so interested in all this? Well, I talked about the importance of information, and there's a lot more information that we have to deal with. You know, you go to a lot of uh, big data presentations or, you know, listen to the salesperson. In the first few minutes, they'll put out an, an eye-boggling quote uh, about how much data, how much more data is being generated now than ever before. And I could do that as well, but there's a lot more data out there than there ever has been. And that's true in the world and in our enterprises. And this data is too valuable to delete. We can't just get rid of it like we have been doing. Even when there's little signal to lots of noise, by the way, and that's one thing that we have to get used to in NoSQL, is that we're going to be putting out a lot, of, or we're going to be storing, trying to manage a lot of information for which only, there's only a few nuggets that are going to come out of there. They're going to be highly impactful nuggets, and as time goes on, those are going to be the competitive differentiators. But for now, it, it's hard to say per capita that it has the same impact on an enterprise as, say, your enterprise data warehouse. But that's, that's going to be okay. That's got to be considered okay. It's going to be less costly to be storing that data. Keep that in mind. Speaking of cost, we've had the dramatic decline in the cost of hardware, especially storage. If storage was still $100 a, ter a, a gigabyte, there'd be no big data revolution underway. We still couldn't afford to store it, but we can. So why NoSQL? Why does NoSQL fit? For big data. There's more data model flexibility. So a lot of these solutions, like our sponsor solution today, use JSON as the data model. I say think about XML. There are some out there that actually implement with XML. There's no schema first requirement. Load the data however it may be. And that means that row to row, and they don't use that terminology, but document to document, uh, it, they will not necessarily be the same. Now, with semi-structured data, like web data, web log data that you're scraping off uh, the web, uh, that's semi-structured because some of the fields are going to be the same from record to record. And in a lot of these implementations I know that we've done, uh, I would say that record to record, you're looking at probably 75 to 80% consistency from one to the next. So we're not talking that every record has to be completely different, but it is one big old table with a, a fairly homogenous type of data set that you're putting in there. Faster time to insight, the provisioning time for this, especially with the cloud, tends to be a lot quicker. Relaxed asset, I'll talk a little bit more about that on a next slide. And this means eventual consistency. Eventual consistency, not necessarily immediate consistency. Okay, these are things that we've taken for granted in the relational database world. Now, it's very important as we step out into NoSQL and we say, here we have a workload for NoSQL, that we understand some of the, some of the shortcomings, if you will, of that NoSQL environment. Eventual consistency is important for transactions because transactions, you know, they all, it, it should be either all or nothing. And if it can, if, you know, if that can be compromised, then we have to understand the risk that we're taking with the relaxed asset. But we're trading consistency for availability because truly we can make all this available with the scale out solutions uh, that is NoSQL. Acid would crush things like storing clicks on Google. Google could never store all of its clicks if it had to deal with Acid compliance, et cetera. Okay, you might be thinking, well, you know, we're not Google and this presentation is not supposed to be geared to, to the Googles, and indeed it isn't, but a lot, of, a lot of companies out there, especially in the global 2000, you're like many Googles, you have a lot of data. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot, of, a lot more sensor data. There's a lot more we can be doing with our websites and a lot more that companies want to do with their websites. They want to understand navigational patterns. They want to offer up more content in real time based upon analytics and so on. There's low upfront software costs although it's not free, even if it's open source, even if you're not getting the commercial version, definitely not free, a little more people cost involved here, and it does utilize Java primarily, but other programming languages work obviously as well, but uh, this can be an issue. This can be an issue because a lot of IT shops have been marginalizing Java, C++, Ruby, all the programming languages. They've been pushing it aside for the past 10 years, and now we're saying, 
this solution needs some of that. This solution needs especially Java experience. So let's bring that back a little bit. And full scans. And there I'm talking about Hadoop, not necessarily some of the other NoSQL models that I'll be talking about as we go forward. The programmers love the freedoms. Uh, is there a DBA in the mix in NoSQL? Uh, yes, but, uh, and, and there's a lot of work there in terms of making sure the cluster is set up appropriately and so on, but there isn't the same kind of work. It isn't a data model kind of work because we don't actually do a data model up front and, and things of that nature. So programmers love the freedoms. Uh, now let's talk just a little bit about Hadoop. I know that uh, Hadoop is only one of the many data models within NoSQL, but it's, it's an important one. It's, it's the one for our analytics. It's a parallel programming framework. It's a combination of two things, HDFS plus MapReduce. Now there's a lot more components in the overall distribution. In any of the distributions that you, you go with, be it the IBM one, the, the uh, Cloudera one, the Hortonworks one, there's going to be a lot more components here to try to make it all work together. And in one of those distributions, you're guaranteed that all of the versions work together. So that's one of the really good things about the, the distributions. But anyway, what is this? HDFS is the Hadoop distributed file system. This is the way to store the data. And this, is, this involves replication. This involves specifying block sizes, although in Hadoop, typically 64 meg block sizes. And this is running on commodity hardware. And, uh, that's a class of machine. It's still a, it's still a, you know, it's like a five, to, I've been spending five to $10,000 per node on my Hadoop clusters. Okay. That gives you an idea. It's not the hundred thousand, but it's not the Commodore 64 or the Gateway 2000. So don't try to put those machines in a Hadoop cluster, but co commodity class. Now who's doing what with Hadoop? Well, here's some examples. The first three, Three and a half are really from that dot-com world. Okay, that's where you're going to get most of the, you know, strong case studies today. But this will bleed down into the global 2000, which are taking it up right now. So there you see some of the different uses for Hadoop. Yahoo's very prominent uh, with their use of Hadoop. 40,000 plus nodes, petabytes clearly. But you might be looking at some of these things and saying, well, my problem does not require a system of that scale. Well, you can use the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, for example, to build a virtual 20 node cluster. And that's what uh, New York Times does, for example. So they convert their uh, images, they put all their images in Hadoop and things of that nature. So think about all the images that you could be utilizing if you only had a system that, that really worked well for that kind of data. Well, maybe you do, maybe Hadoop is it. So let's talk about ACID. Um, ACID is uh, important in our relational database transactional systems, and you've probably heard the term, maybe you haven't broken this down. Well, this is the breakdown. Atomicity, full transactions pass or fail. Consistency, the database is in the valid, a valid state after each transaction. Isolation, transactions do not interfere with one another. And durability, transactions will remain committed no matter what. There's a crash or whatever. In other words, this is all about transactions. You can start modifying the database with an insert, update, delete over different tables and then decide if you want to keep it all or not. So why am I bringing this up? Well, NoSQL solutions, uh, I don't want to paint them with a, a big old broad brush, but you have to look at the asset compliance of that solution to make sure it fits your workload. And a lot of them will offer eventual consistency, like I mentioned. And so one thing I've been, you know, continuing to struggle try to, to try to get a handle on is what is the actual risk that I have by not being fully asset compliant with this solution? And that's what the CIO wants to know. So if I, if I do this, what's the risk? What, what's the risk of compromising the data, compromising a transaction, et cetera? Uh, first of all, I know of no transactions that have been compromised. I know of no I guess, shortcomings in the implementations as a result of the lack of asset compliance. None of that has got back to me. That's not to say that they're not out there. Uh, and if you know one, please get in touch with me. I'd love to know about it. But I've talked with vendors. I've, I've been hands-on with the solutions and I've had a hard time really articulating what that is. 
It's small, that's for sure, but it's still there and you still need to be aware of it. So what gives the CIO heartburn about NoSQL? Why don't we just overpopulate our environment with all this NoSQL business? Well, what's uh, putting on some of the brakes is, first of all, the developer skills. I talked about that. We've been marginalizing Java, now we've got to bring it back. The lack of asset compliance, I just talked about that. Just really unsure about what that means to our workloads. And uh, hopefully you can see that obviously it has less meaning to an analytical workload. Tools are lacking, okay, and the projects are flawed. Just like any software, maybe a, a bit more. Uh, some people would refer to the nature of some of these products as being kind of sub version one uh, level for, for now fast nature of unburdened projects. These projects, when they do take off, they tend to really take off and things tend to really happen quickly. The provisioning is all very quick compared to what we're used to in the last, say, five to 10 years ago. If you're still in that whole, we got a big old provisioning cycle of five to 10 years ago, that's not gonna carry forward. So a lot of the things that you're used to uh, needing to do during that provisioning cycle, you're gonna have to do it either quicker or before you start provisioning or understand that you're going to be doing it after provisioning. And then the projects tend to take off. A lot of them are, are more adopted to the agile methodology. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Different developers, schema less, schema light -like models. So what do we do when we need to have a data model review? Because that's a typical step for a lot of projects before they move into, into production. There's a data model review. Well, what do we do? We don't have a data model. Well, I'm struggling with this as well. I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I represent what most of the data will be or what all of the different profiles will be? It's not your grandfather's Irwin model, nothing wrong with Irwin, but it's not that kind of model that we're doing here. So I've been using Excel spreadsheets and so on to try to represent what kind of data we're going to be capturing or we anticipate capturing because we obviously can accommodate the unexpected with these NoSQL solutions. Okay, and the lack of payback methodology, and that's just really um, part of the culture of these projects. So far, uh, not many have uh, articulated what the ROI is for them. They've become data-centered as opposed to business-centered. And frankly, that's a lot of where my consulting comes in, is transferring these from being data-centered to being ROI-driven, business-centered projects, and still producing results for the business. Take a large problem and divide it into subproblems. That's the whole idea behind MapReduce. Now, I haven't mentioned this much yet. I said it's part of Hadoop. It's part of a lot of these NoSQL uh, uh, projects, uh, including our sponsors today. So the idea is to do as much as possible within a given node. And then when you finally have done everything you possibly can within that node, then you take it to the reduce step, and that's where some of the nodes will participate in capturing the data and doing further processing upon that. It's just, it's really just subsequent steps within a query that are called map and reduce, and they're Java, uh, Java development, and you also specify how much parallelism you want in each of the maps, or in the map, and in each of the reducers. So there may be multiple reduce uh, uh, code that you develop depending upon the nature of the query. And here we see it graphically, the, the work is done on the nodes and then it's reduced uh, down to output. This is the paradigm, if you will, of how you get data out of many NoSQL solutions. Here's a little bit more about that programming framework. Uh, MapReduce jobs are composed of the map and the reduce. User only writes the map and the reduce and how many times you're going to spawn that in parallel upon the data. So if you have 10 nodes, which is pretty small, but if you have 10 nodes, you can say, well, you know, I want two, I want the map run in two units of parallelism. So then each of them will cover five nodes and so on. So a quick summary right now, parallel database systems, which we're used to structured data with a known schema purchased as an appliance. And actually that's not too uh, uh, um, undifferent or <laughs> too different from NoSQL solutions today because a lot of them are becoming more bundled, like I mentioned, the distributions for Hadoop, et cetera. So it's becoming an easier purchase, but it's not completely there like a parallel database system in terms of an appliance. Companies like Couchbase are making it a lot easier by doing value add to the open source. And then fault tolerance in our 
SQL systems, uh, failures are assumed to be rare. In NoSQL, failures will happen. I talked about the commodity class nature of the nodes. And so one of the you know, really uh, important elements of these solutions is their ability to pick up when there is a failure. So that while they don't do RAID necessarily, they do replication. And so most of my implementations have been times three. So every day just multiply times three throughout the network. But there is a question here. I'm not going to answer it today because it's a big question. And I'm just putting it out there to let you know it's still a question. Where do we do big data analytics? Where do we do them? Do we do them in Hadoop? Do we do them in a other NoSQL? Or do we do them in SQL? So let's talk about some of the different data models to lead into uh, the document model that Diffie will talk about some more. There's key value stores. That's like NoSQL OLTP. A record may look like just what you see there. Now, some of the solutions in, that are key value are React, uh, Redis, Memcached, and they have different terminology. So a, a table, like what we're used to, might be a bucket. A row might be a key value, and a row ID might be a key, for example. We would specify things like the replication factor for how much, how many times we want that data replicated across the nodes. We specify the definitions for getting the data success and putting the data back success. This is all really good for things like session data. Uh, so if you're trying to store uh, a user session attributes, key value store is really good for that. So when you're talking about enhancing your website, maybe it's your external website, maybe it's internal websites. When you're trying to enhance these systems, um, you might consider key value stores for supporting some of that. But key value stores are not good for querying by the values within the key value. And so that's where document stores come in. And document stores actually add a lot of additional enhancements, I guess, to key value stores. Document stores are key value, but they have additional capabilities. Uh, the values are queryable, for example. There might be materialized views or indexes. Um, examples of this are Couchbase, MongoDB, MarkLogic. Okay, Couchbase, Couchbase, our sponsor today, and MongoDB. They utilize JSON format, and MarkLogic, for example, uses XML format. Uh, documents, as they're known, uh, what we would call a row, okay, they call it a document. Documents are addressed by URIs, supports a REST interface, so there's an HTTP type of um, interface, I guess you might say, to the data to do all of the operations upon that data. That's a little different too. And here you see some of the things that document stores are really good at, and I'm going to let Dipti expand on that. And then there's this thing kind of off the side called graph stores. It falls into the NoSQL category, but you don't have to have really big data to take advantage of graph stores. It's whenever relationships are the really important thing. Whenever you need to navigate relationships quickly, or maybe you need to do a social network, which is uh, you know, very common in telecom today. We want to know the impact of things upon an individual's social network. It's also increasingly common in retail and so forth. But whenever you need to navigate a, uh, a relationships really quickly, uh, Neo4j is one example of this. Uh, it's it just really, you don't have to have the biggest data set to take advantage of this. So for an e-commerce platform, for example, you might need all of these I'm talking about. You might need key value for the shopping cart and the session type of data. You might need the document for completed orders. And you might need the graph to do social discovery. And you might need the relational database systems for the data warehouse, for the for the batch collection of the information or for inventory management. So here you see that depending upon the size and the complexity, it would uh, dictate a little bit anyway, what kind of data model you're going with in NoSQL. And you're going to get these slides so you can check that out. The NoSQL challenge, it's to get beyond the, the Netflixes and the PayPals and all the kind of new modern companies. The investors expect with all the investment made in NoSQL that it's going to get beyond. It's going to go get into that second tier there, that global 2000 tier. Some of those com companies have an awful lot of data as well, and they definitely have a need for NoSQL. So we're working with them to try to figure out what that need is. And we won't even mention SMBs yet, but they're out there and also get these things into production. You have to look at each workload like eBay does. This is for an analytics workload. 
and they have this thing on there called the singularity, which most of us would not have. So we have in the blue, we have the EDW. In the green, they have Hadoop. And they show what each is good at, and they plot their workloads against this a spider graph like this to determine where it should go. And there is some overlap in the middle now, isn't there? There definitely is some overlap. Some of the higher, some of the, yeah, some of the higher end data warehouses, you know, some of that might be siphoned off, some of the colder data might be siphoned off into a Hadoop type of storage, for example. So that's, this just represents the mentality that we need to get to. So the hybrid information universe, I don't have time to explain all these, but you know, if you're in it, if you're living it, that there's data stream processing now, there's master data management, there's syndicated data, there's columnar databases, and oh yes, there's some NoSQL, there's Hadoop, and then there's the data warehouse appliance, which of course is SQL. We gotta mix and match all these things, and then we might have multiple NoSQL databases in our operational environment. So all of this is on the table right now, which is making life confusing, but it's all about supporting that important asset of information. And oh, by the way, we're also bringing in the cloud at the same time, so we're forging the cloud strategies. We need an integration strategy between big data and, if I may say it, unbig data that's in the SQL environment. There will be integration requirements. There is the need for data integration with the enterprise. There's also the need to speed things up. Hopefully I've emphasized that we have a lot of work to be done in information management. We need to get about it. We need to rethink our waterfall approaches. We need to speed it up. We need to cut out the fat. We need to get to deliverables sooner and we need to repeat because ultimately that drives the best value into the organization. So that's a, that's a must do in terms of stepping into NoSQL agile approaches. Your cloud strategy is also important. Are you going public or private? selectively, hybrid, et cetera, you need to develop a cloud strategy because you really need to consider the cloud as you step into NoSQL. Now you'll get the slide again, but not all workloads are good for any old platform. And this is where a lot of the problems come in as you try to put the wrong workload into the wrong platform. What will motivate IT to adopt NoSQL? All the things I talked about here today, tired of losing deals to hybrid IT organizations out there in some business department that's more agile, okay? And the NoSQL tool marketplace will innovate. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dipti. She's gonna tell you about some of those innovations from Couchbase. Great, thanks William. Hello everyone, uh, this is Dipti Borkar. I'm uh, the Director of Product Management at Couchbase. For the rest of the session, I'll talk about, um, I'll focus more on uh, NoSQL for interactive applications and um, focus on how the document database is different from the relational database and also is a great fit for interactive applications. Uh, just to set the context, uh, Couchbase is a NoSQL document database. It's an open source uh, project as well. And our next coming up version is version 2.0 with a lot of great features. But I'll focus on the use cases first. So as, as William mentioned earlier, we are seeing market ad adoption across all kinds of uh, enterprises. Uh, many of them are internet companies, social gaming, ad targeting, uh, social networks are, are, are pretty big customers, pretty big markets for us. Uh, but on the other hand, we're also seeing other enterprises, communication, retail, um, and so on. Here's just a, a view of some of our customers. At the moment, we have a range of deployments from some customers have three to four nodes in a cluster, some customers have significantly larger clusters, um, and so we are seeing a wide range of, of deployment across these various um, enterprise companies. But I'll focus most of my talk today on relational versus uh, no SQL document databases. As William mentioned earlier, uh, you saw the, the data page where you have uh, the information about the record IDs, um, and so every relational database has the concept of databases and tables. Every table has rows and columns. And really every record, it looks pretty identical with, um, uh, with a, few diff a few columns uh, and, the same, uh, and every record has the same structure. On the other hand, on a document model, every document could look very different. You can have 
you can have some nested documents. Uh, you can have some which are um, which have a few attributes, and so you can start representing complex objects, uh, complex uh, uh, entities. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have a user profile where we have two tables. We have a user info table and an address info table. And you have a foreign key, which is the zip ID that's connecting the two tables. And typically, you'd perform a join across them to get access to either a single record or multiple records. Now, how do you represent the same information in a document database using the document model? At the highest level, you have all the information about a specific entity or a specific object represented in a single document. And so here you see that the ID attribute, the person last names, uh, the city and the state, everything is in a single JSON document. And it, in some ways, it's equivalent to a, almost a pre-computed join across the two tables, across the user info table and the geo info table. And that's the, that's, this easy flexibility is what gives people uh, the, uh, the possibilities of rapidly deploying and developing applications, making changes to applications with fast iterations, and use, using the agile model to push out these updates to your end customers. Now, the other inherent problem that we've seen with uh, relational databases, and I actually uh, come from the relational world, started off writing uh, uh, index code for the DB2LUW kernel, what we've seen is that most relational databases have a scale-up model. You tend to use uh, more powerful hardware to, uh, as your performance needs increase. While your application tier might very easily scale out uh, using stateless uh, app servers. But your, the curves for the relational database look very different with your costs increasing exponentially at a certain point and also uh, with the system not being able to perform, particularly for write throughput, um, very efficiently. On the other hand, most uh, NoSQL databases, including Couchbase, scale out horizontally. And this is, it could be on commodity hardware. It could be physical hardware. It could be instances in the cloud. And so along with your web tier, your application server tier, which scales out horizontally, now your data tier as well can scale out horizontally, and you can add more servers or reduce nodes uh, depending on your workload. If you are seeing spikes in your workload or constantly increasing workload, particularly for uh, front-end applications, you can simply very easily add servers to the cluster uh, and uh, back up your application. So there's a couple of different considerations that you need to think about for uh, when working with NoSQL, when looking at NoSQL databases, particularly for interactive applications. And here's a, uh, here's a few of them. We talked about easy scalability, where it's, uh, it's very easy to add uh, nodes to your cluster and grow out the data tier horizontally, uh, as well as the flexible data model, which gives developers the ability to do rapid application deployment. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, the need for consistent high performance. It could be low latency needs or high throughput needs. In addition to that, with most of these applications being on all the time without, with uh, global deployments, you, the need for having the application up and running 24-7 is important as well. And so these are some considerations you should think about um, as you start off your project. Now let's take a look at some examples and use cases uh, and drill down a little bit more. There's two kinds of reasons to use NoSQL. One, uh, the first type is for data-driven use cases, and the second type is for performance-driven use cases. On the data-driven use cases side, you, have, you might have the need for unlimited data growth. Uh, you might have data that's changing very often. The structure changes quickly. Uh, particularly if you have third-party data, data that you're aggregating. For example, you might use a Twitter feed or a, a Facebook feed, um, and that's where you might need a more flexible data model. And a document database and a document model uh, lets you handle these various requirements. You might also have the need to represent hierarchical objects uh, and sparse data. And again, document databases give you that flexibility to represent objects that may be simple or complex. 
In addition, you, your applications might have performance-driven use cases. Uh, one that we've seen uh, coming up quite a bit is the need for low latency, uh, sub-millisecond latencies. Uh, ad targeting networks that I will talk about in just a minute require extremely low latencies to get their ads served on, um, on websites. On the other hand, for viral applications or for uh, front-end applications where you have a large number of users, throughput matters quite a bit. And this might be, um, this could be read throughput or write throughput or for mixed workloads. And different NoSQL databases perform in different ways. And so think about the kind of workload uh, you want to, uh, your application needs, and pick the right NoSQL database based on that workload. Let's go into a little more details of some sample applications. Uh, here's what we have seen at Couchbase. Uh, we're working with um, uh, several customers one-on-one -on -one to build different kind of web applications uh, or interactive applications. Uh, here you see the first one is a content uh, store or a content and the metadata management store. And we're actually working with McGraw Hill uh, on this a little bit more, and I'll go into the details of this specific use case. But there's a few additional ones here, like social gaming, ad targeting, uh, building session stores, um, or high availability caching for your applications. But let's take a look at the details. What exactly do you store in the database? What are the application requirements? Uh, and why NoSQL is a good fit for some of these applications? The first one is social gaming. So for social gaming, we have a lot of customers that we work with, Zinger being one of, uh, one of the biggest ones. Um, where user account information, profile information, uh, the game, the state of the game, all this information is stored as documents, individual documents within the database. And in addition, they need to, uh, they, the application needs to grow out horizontally. So the data tier needs to scale out. The experience for the user needs to be very awesome because otherwise they'll just move on to a, a different game that might have a better user experience. And so low latency matters quite a bit. Game uptime is important where you really can't afford for the game to go down, and that's where high availability through replication comes in. That's where online upgrades come in, online rebalancing comes in with, uh, for scaling out the clusters and so on. Uh, and they want the ability to push out application changes really fast. And so that's, where, uh, that's why NoSQL is a good fit, because of this, the, it, it can scale out horizontally. Uh, it's great for viral gro growth, uh, but also is, is great for smaller applications. Some, some social gaming companies have multiple games. Some of them are small, some of them are large. Uh, but for all these, they tend to use um, a NoSQL database. Uh, and uh, the flexible data model is the other big one uh, that keeps coming up. Moving on to ad targeting. For ad targeting, uh, we've seen companies like AOL, which is a, a, a pretty big um, uh, ad targeting uh, company, pro uh, I think the third or fourth largest, stores user profile information. So they actually store the history of uh, what ads are being served, what, what people are buying, uh, the serving history for, uh, for both the user as well as the advertiser and so on in the database um, as documents. Um, and in terms of the application requirements, again, one of the, uh, another application where uh, the low latency becomes incredibly important. And so end-to-end, -end, in terms of serving an ad, they need to, uh, they need to, uh, the, uh, the ad to be served from the front end to the database and back in less than 40 milliseconds, which leaves uh, maybe a couple of milliseconds for the database itself uh, to get that, uh, get that data. And so they typically look for one or two millisecond uh, time responses in case of both reads and, uh, and writes. Uh, and then scalability is important. As these ad companies tend to grow, um, some of them start off small and they grow over time. They just want the ability to add more servers and scale out horizontally. And again, NoSQL is a great fit because of this the sub-millisecond response times and uh, the ease of scale out. But let me drill down into a specific use case. Uh, we are working with McGraw-Hill Labs. Um, they're looking at building a self-adapting uh, learning portal with Couchbase. And essentially, it's a content and a metadata store. Le but let's look at the problem. So in terms of the problem, they have, uh, as some of you may know, they have a large amount of assets, with textbooks, digital assets, and so on. But learning is moving online in large numbers uh, with smart devices, whether it's the iPhone, iPad, consumption devices, 
students tend to uh, want more interactive ways of learning. And so with that comes the need to build an interactive learning environment that can scale out to hundreds of thousands or millions of students that, has, uh, uh, that can support and serve out content that uh, McGraw-Hill owns or third-party content that they, they probably don't own, like uh, BBC content or content from the Associated Press. And they also want to include open content like Wikipedia content and, and so on, uh, but build rich applications, learning apps uh, that are self-adapting. And so they looked at uh, the challenge for them was to build an interactive content delivery store. They looked at the cloud uh, in terms of uh, provisioning and deployment. But they were looking for a solution that was elastic, uh, that was low latency, uh, supported uh, uh, integration with full text search, and was capable of generating rec rankings or recommendations. They looked at a co couple of different choices. And as, as we talked about earlier, different problems um, uh, ha might, a different solution might be good for them. And so they looked at XML databases, uh, column stores, uh, in-memory databases, and so on. But what it came down to was uh, they were looking for something that did good caching, had good caching abilities. Um, they wanted stats, like the way social games have stats available in terms of leaderboards and stuff like that. And then they, had, they wanted the smarts built in, uh, like the ad targeting networks. And so that's where Couchbase came in, and they decided to build uh, the platform using Couchbase and a couple of other technologies, like uh, Elasticsearch. They built their, um, uh, they're building their own middleware, um, as well as the JavaScript front end. And so this is uh, uh, the new modern stack for the, the front end inter interactive applications that you might start seeing uh, moving forward. This is the end result. Uh, this was a prototype, a uh, proof of concept, and it's available as an open source pro uh, uh, project as well. And so you, you feel free to go ahead and take a look at the code, uh, take a look at how it uses Couchbase as well as text search at the back end. Um, and with that, I uh, just wanted to show you a couple of screenshots of, uh, of what a Couchbase cluster might look like. Here you see that a cluster has a few different nodes, uh, eight nodes in the cluster with the ability to see RAM usage, CPU usage, and so on, along with uh, the ability to see uh, what's actually going on, visibility into the operations, and uh, some great stats uh, that you can see while you're in production as well. With that, let's open it up uh, for Q&A and uh, see, let's, let me just take a look and see if there's any questions at the moment. Um, I'm going to have our uh, contact information slide up here. So uh, if we can't get to your question today, we'll uh, feel free to send us an email. Uh, William um, and my emails are up here. So do feel free to reach out to us if we can't get back to you today. Another reminder that we'll have a survey towards the end of this uh, session where uh, we'll, be really, we'll really appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes, give us feedback about the content uh, for the webinar. All right, so let's, let me take a, a quick look at uh, some of the questions here. Um, and um, uh, either William or, or me, depending on the question, uh, will help answer, um, answer it. The question is, a record in NoSQL looks like XML. How are they different? Uh, new, uh, trying to learn new ways, um, uh, and, and per, per, uh, perhaps this person is new to NoSQL as well. Uh, I'll take a quick uh, shot at this, William, and, and feel free to add more to this um, after, um, after I uh, respond. JSON and XML are similar in many ways. JSON is a, a more compressed form of XML. Uh, it is less, uh, it, it isn't typed, and so in XML, for example, you can have a schema that you can validate and so on. JSON is a little more lightweight, uh, and so for application development, uh, a lot of people are starting to use JavaScript for their front end, uh, which means that JSON is a great fit uh, uh, to store data as well so that there's no impedance mismatch across the stack. So you can use JSON in the front end uh, as your object when you're creating the, uh, when you're writing the front end application, but also store it natively as JSON and get back and forth as JSON so you avoid the heavy parsing um, of JSON. Uh, there are other XML databases as well. Um, XML can uh, represent a probably a lot more complex content uh, and can be uh, heavier typed, uh, but JSON is a lot more flexible and lightweight, which is why people tend to use um, JSON. 
Uh, William, anything more to add there? Well, just in case the question was just validating that indeed it is JSON or XML and not something that just looks like it uh, okay. down inside uh, at, in the records, uh, you're absolutely right. That is JSON or that is XML as the case may be. And it's actually pretty simple. It's, it's you know, column name that we're giving it followed by a colon followed by the actual value. If it's in quotes, it's going to be a text. If it's if it's a number, it's going to be a number. Um, but w one thing that uh, I failed to point out that I should is that one of the big differences between a key value store and a document store is the fact that in a document store, you can have arrays or you can have a, a variable number of a certain thing, like let's say a person has multiple phone numbers, but some people have one, some people have two, some people have 10. Uh, you can recur that, that uh, phone number within that document uh, as many times as is necessary. It's like an accordion. It's very flexible that way. Whereas a key value store, it's not so much. So that's one of the big differences there. Great. Thanks, William. Uh, the next question, um, how do we integrate NoSQL with GIS or uh, graphical information systems? Uh, I'll take a quick pass at that one. Uh, so for Couchbase, we actually have uh, experimental geospatial support in uh, the upcoming 2.0 version. Over time, we'll add more support for uh, geo-indexing and, and production support and uh, add more uh, querying capabilities and complex querying capabilities as well. But in general, um, I think uh, uh, some, um, some NoSQL databases may not have that capability. All of us, all the NoSQL stores are fairly early in the product cycle, in the uh, product maturity cycle. Uh, William, anything more to add there? No, I mean, that's, uh, that's the best answer right there is to use some of the capabilities that the vendors are, are adding to their, to their distributions like Couchbase. Great. And um, next question, um, any existing use cases where Couchbase is being used as a data warehouse to support business intelligence applications? So in this case, um, we've seen some the small some smaller uh, shops are looking at Couchbase uh, to build business intelligence capabilities on the top with reporting. Reason being that we have the the ability to build materialized views on data. Uh, but that said, it's really more of um, an OLTP or an operational data store, um, and. Um, and this opens up William's initial question, which he said is a big question, is how do you uh, what, what solutions can handle big data, uh, particularly for data warehousing needs? So might be Hadoop is uh, a better solution on, uh, for complex analytics. William, anything there? No, absolutely right. I mean, you would know better about what your customers are doing with it. Um, I would say that you know, data warehousing and BI is not where I would direct applications for a document store, right. that would be more Hadoop. Right. All right. Uh, I think a follow-up question on uh, GIS. Uh, can it be integrated, and uh, what type of NoSQL provides these capabilities? So in terms of the GIS capabilities, uh, we, this will be built into the main database itself. So there, was, uh, there isn't a need for integrating it with other solutions. Now, there are, uh, while there are other solutions out there that handle more GIS capabilities, it might be a while before we provide integration with those third-party GIS uh, stores. And so that, that's uh, probably something for the future. The next question uh, relates to uh, the data model. And, and so here, let me read out the question. If there is no data model, uh, what kind of modeling can be done or needs to be done prior to development? Uh, and um, how do we type the content in the database? So this is probably more related with a, a document database, so I'll, I'll take a pass at it. In terms of the data model, uh, what I showed earlier was the most basic level of modeling. Uh, typically, you might have information, you might have links to other documents that are stored in, uh, in a document so you can point to them similar to a foreign key. And so you do need to do some amount of data modeling, and we've started to call it document modeling. Uh, before you build your application, you need to represent each entity or each object in a, um, in, as a document and see which, uh, which objects uh, can need to be linked to other objects so that you have the ability to follow these links and get access back. 
Uh, now that said, um, most NoSQL databases and document databases in particular uh, currently do not have the ability to do joins in the database. And so some of that uh, is done at the application level where uh, read, reads of documents are pretty, uh, pretty much free is what we consider because of the low latency and uh, the fast access. And so you, you will have to get the document, follow the link from that document, and get the second document that it's linked to. And so some amount of document modeling does need to be done uh, prior to starting off development with, the, um, uh, with a document database. All right, and I think uh, that's all that we have time for. Uh, if you haven't, if we haven't been able to get to your question, do feel free to reach out to us again. Uh, we really hope that uh, this has been helpful for you in understanding uh, the NoSQL choices that you have, as well as the kind of use cases uh, where NoSQL fits in uh, for both analytics as well as uh, interactive applications. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.